guys, Mr. Backerberg here. This is part one of lesson 5.1. Two objectives for this video. We're going to use trig identities to evaluate some trig functions, and we're going to use trig identities to rewrite and simplify down some trig expressions. As we're going through this stuff, you want to have your trig sheet out that I gave you guys. We're going to be focusing on those reciprocal identities, quotient identities, and Pythagorean identities that we introduced back in chapter four. So in this first example, here's what we've got. We know that the secant of our angle u is negative 3 halves, and we're told that our tangent of u is going to be a positive value. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and find the values for all six of our other trig functions. And the first one we're going to look at finding is the cosine of angle u. And the reason we're going to do that first is because there's a relationship between the secant and the cosine. They're reciprocals of each other. So that reciprocal identity says if we have a secant in order to find the cosine of our angle u, all we have to do is flip that secant fraction over. So that's going to be 2 over negative 3, or negative 2 thirds. Now that we have that cosine value, we're going to use one of our Pythagorean identities to help us find the sine of angle u. And the Pythagorean identity that I'm going to use is the one that says the sine squared of u plus the cosine squared of u equals 1. We know our cosine value is negative 2 thirds, so I'm just going to plug that in. So we've got the sine squared of u plus negative 2 thirds squared equals 1. Now remember, when we square a fraction, we have to square the top and the bottom. So we get the sine squared of u plus 4 ninths equals 1. Well, if we subtract that 4 ninths over to the other side, we're going to end up with the sine squared of u equals 5 ninths. And then in order to get our sine all by itself, we're going to have to get rid of this squared power by square rooting. And remember, when we square root something, there's a positive and a negative answer. So we get the sine of u equals, well, if we square root this fraction, on top we've got a square root of 5. On bottom, the square root of 9 is just 3. But we can't have both a positive and a negative answer. So we have to think about what's going to happen with this sine value. And here's what we know. Earlier, we were given a negative secant value, and in turn, a negative cosine value. And we know that our tangent is positive. So we have to think about what quadrant that's happening in. Negative cosine, positive tangent. We're going to be in quadrant 3. And down in quadrant 3, signs are negative values. So we're going to use the negative root 5 over 3 as our answer for the sign. If we have the sine, we should be able to find the cosecant because they're just reciprocals of each other. So we're going to flip that fraction over. So our cosecant of u is going to equal negative 3 over root 5. But we can't leave our answer with a radical on the bottom. So we have to rationalize this thing by multiplying top and bottom by root 5. So we get negative 3 root 5 over 5. Now as far as finding the tangent, we've got a couple of options. But I'm going to use one of my quotient identities. There's a quotient identity that says the tangent of angle u is the sine of u over the cosine of u. Well, we have both of those values. We know that the sine of u is negative root 5 over 3. And we know that our cosine from earlier was negative 2 over 3. And I'm just going to simplify this down. I see a couple negatives, so I'm going to turn those into positives. Top and bottom each have a divided by 3. So I'm going to multiply both of those by 3 in order to get those things to cancel out. So then on top, we've got a root 5. On bottom, we've got 2. Last thing we need to do is find a cotangent. So I'm going to use a reciprocal identity with that tangent value, because all we have to do is flip the tangent fraction over. So we get 2 over root 5. And again, we're going to have to do a little bit of rationalizing. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by root 5. So we get 2 root 5 over 5. And now we have all six of our trig values. Now this next stuff that we're going to be doing is going to be completely different than anything you've seen before. What we're going to be doing is simplifying down some trig expressions using different algebraic techniques in combination with some of those trig identities that we're working with. So here's the first one we're looking at. We've got the sine of x times a cosine squared of x minus the sine of x. And we're just going to simplify this down as much as we can. So here's the first thing I see when I'm looking at this. I see a sine of x in the first term. I also see a sine of x in the second term. So what I'm going to do is a little GCF factoring. It shows up in both of those terms, so I'm going to factor it out to the front. In our first term, we've still got a cosine squared left over. In our second term, we took the sine of x out of there, but don't forget there's a one placeholder in there. So now we've got the sine of x times the cosine squared of x minus 1. Now here's where one of our trig identities is going to come into play. 
I see this cosine squared of x minus 1, and we've got that one Pythagorean identity that says the sine squared of u plus cosine squared of u equals 1, and this looks almost like that. If we were to rearrange this thing and subtract the cosine squared over to the right-hand side, then we'd end up with the sine squared of u equals 1 minus the cosine squared of u. But if we look at how this is set up and how what we have is set up is they're opposites of each other. Down here we've got a positive cosine in comparison to a negative cosine. Down here we've got a negative 1 being compared to a positive 1. So I'm actually going to do a little bit more factoring with this in order to get those signs to work out. I'm going to leave that sine of x out in front, but then I'm going to factor out a negative 1. And when I do that, when I take a negative 1 out of this positive cosine, it makes it a negative cosine squared, like we have in this identity on the top right. And when I take this negative 1 out of a negative 1, it turns into a positive 1. So now what I can do is I can do a little bit of substitution. Because we know that this stuff right here that I'm putting in this green box is the same as this stuff up here, which is equal to sine squared. So what I'm going to do is just replace the sine squared for that stuff in the green boxes. So that's a sine squared of x. I'm going to multiply this negative 1 times the sine of x that's out in front. So we have a negative sine of x. So now we've got negative sine of x times the sine squared of x. Well, remember, this is a first powered sine at the very beginning if there's nothing written in there. If we take a first powered thing times a second powered thing, we're going to end up with a third powered thing because we add those powers together. So we get a negative sine cubed of x. And that's going to be our final answer. There's no more simplifying that we can do from there. So we're just going to circle that and leave it as is. In example B, we've got the sine of theta plus a cotangent of theta times a cosine of theta. And again, we're trying to use some of our identities to simplify this down as much as we can. Now on the last one, we could do a little GCF factoring to get us started. But we don't have that going on here. We have a sine and we have a cosine, so we can't factor that stuff out. So I'm focusing on this cotangent piece right here. There's a quotient identity that says if we do the cotangent of theta, that's going to be a cosine of theta divided by a sine of theta. So I'm going to replace this cotangent with our cosine over the sine. So then we get the sine of theta plus cosine of theta over the sine of theta times another cosine of theta. Now if we look at actually multiplying these fractions together on the right hand side, cosine times a cosine is a cosine squared of theta, and a bottom sine times one is just the sine of theta. Now we've got a sine of theta plus cosine squared over the sine. It looks like we're adding fractions. And in order to add fractions together, we need common denominators. Right now our sine is over 1, so in order to get that over the sine, we're going to have to multiply top and bottom by a sine of theta. Sine of theta times sine of theta is sine squared of theta. And now that's going to be over the sine of theta. Plus we've got a cosine squared of theta over a sine of theta. Now these two fractions have common denominators, so I'm going to go ahead and put them together. So now we've got a sine squared of theta plus a cosine squared of theta all over the sine of theta. Now we've got another identity happening. We've got a Pythagorean identity that says the sine squared plus a cosine squared is going to equal 1. And that's what we have on top. We have sine squared plus cosine squared. So we've got 1 over the sine of theta. But we're not quite done yet because we don't typically like to leave these things as fractions. So now we're going to use a reciprocal identity to turn 1 over the sine into a cosecant of theta. All right, now we're going to look at things a little bit differently because now we're going to work on factoring out some trig expressions. And I actually want you to ignore the trig for right now. In this first one, it says the secant squared of theta minus 1. Don't even look at the secant squared. Pretend it just says x squared minus 1. If we look at how that's set up, that's difference of perfect squares factoring. So we'd go x plus 1 and x minus 1. But we didn't have a plain x. We had a secant. So when we factor this thing out, it's going to be the secant of theta plus 1 and the secant of theta minus 1. In our next one, again, I'm going to ask you to ignore the trig. So I'm going to make this 4x squared plus x minus 3. OK, this is factoring a quadratic with an a value. We're going to have to do maybe some guess and check factoring. When we factor it out, it ends up being 4x minus 3 and x plus 1. But again, we didn't have x's. We had tangents. So it's 4 tangent of theta 
minus 3, and the tangent of theta, plus 1. This next one is going to be a little bit trickier because we have a cosecant squared minus a cotangent of x minus 3. So we have two different trig ratios. And when we're factoring or simplifying, we usually want to have things in terms of either just one plane function or in sines and cosines. So what I'm looking at is I'm actually looking at this first piece. We've got a Pythagorean identity that says the cosecant squared of x is equal to 1 plus the cotangent squared of x. So I'm going to replace this in our equation with a 1 plus the cotangent squared of x. So 1 plus cotangent squared of x minus a cotangent of x minus 3. And I'm going to look at combining some like terms. We've got a 1 out in front and a minus 3 on the end. So combining those, we've got a cotangent squared of x minus a cotangent of x minus 2. Now again, ignore the trig stuff and just look at it as a plain function. Pretend this says x squared minus x minus 2. Okay, we would factor that out into x minus 2 and x plus 1. But again, we didn't have just plain x's, we had cotangents. So it's cotangent of x minus 2 and cotangent of x plus 1. That's going to be it for this video. Please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.